Hey, Patrick. Hey, Michael J. So, uh, just uh, breaking the fourth wall here for a second. We were going to say we were going to talk about standard, but then you and I just started talking about modern, and I think we should just talk about modern for a few minutes and see where it goes, because you were saying some awesome stuff. Um, to to uh, they, they, this is like Paul, this is like Tom Lapilli's fourth wall. You ever see that design he made for Magic? I mean, obviously it wasn't like a real design, but it was just uh, a colorless and a white for a zero four. When fourth wall enters the battlefield, you are playing a card game. Um, I've never <laughs> seen that, but I could. I, I, yeah, I, I could get behind modern, it. Man. So, uh, I, just to start where, where you were as, as starting from, I was saying. Uh, just a follow-up from what we talked about a few weeks ago. I bought four inspiring vantages. I threw them into my into my Naya Burn deck uh, that I, I won the PPTQ with uh, a few months ago, and then took out all the green. And I, I just it never bothered me to have two mountains and two sacred foundries, not one time. And I have dealt hundreds of hands at this point. And that and um, great soup. Like I, you know, I'm probably gonna play in Utah again. You know. Uh, it was awesome to hang out with Aaron and Jack last time, and and uh, I think I'm going to go back there again to play in the their RPTQ. And you have some opinions about whether I should play Burn again. I I'm very confident playing Burn. I like I like the the way, Burning. I do want to note, by the way, all five of those Kaladesh lands that uh, that are they're like the Scars lands. Yep. All five of them have showed up in uh, top 32s so far already. Yeah, they're awesome lands. All five, all the way around. I got but, two of them uh, in, in Friday Night Magic a few weeks ago in draft. Nice. It was awesome. Yeah. Nice. And a smuggler's copter. How about Dude, that I draft? I love cards in, in draft. Uh, so, yeah, burn sucks, man. Uh, <laughs> and it's not just because, like, this past weekend, the SCG opened in Milwaukee. Uh, it continued to confirm the same thing. It's not that burn inherently sucks. It's actually kind of inherently fine. The problem is that... People are well. There's two problems. First, the same problem as always, which is that if people want to beat Burn, they definitely can. Oh, I've like, got four, nobody. Four firewalkers on my sideboard these days. Second of all, second of all, and this is the real problem. The real problem is the uh, the the new kids on the block for modern line up very well, line up well against Burn. Dredge has become the deck to beat. And, uh, and like, like Dredge this past weekend, uh, was the, was a tie for the most popular deck on day two of the, the open in Milwaukee with burn dredge and burn were the two most popular decks. So they were both 15 and a half percent of the, uh, day two metagame. However, <laughs> the top 32 metagame weighted by finish <laughs> dredge up to 27 burn down to 3%. So burn did horror bad on day horror two. bad yeah basically the way that this past uh, this past weekend went the decks that did really well were dredge affinity bant spirits uh, ad nauseum and scape shift and then zoo and Jess guy did okay uh, infect bant eldrazi kiki cord and that white red blood moon deck they did they were okay they were basically expectation. And then Abzan, Jund, Lantern, and Delver were all kind of like, eh, a little below average. And then Burn and Elves did really bad. And all the weird decks that people played that were not already listed. They shouldn't but, have played uh, to begin with. The the Burn decks, man, it's it's tough because uh, it's not like you it's not like you want to be playing Burn in, against these Dredge decks, but uh, the the, the, the popular ley line of Sanctity, I think, is... It's not just the fact that people are already playing Core Firewalkers everywhere, and Blessed Alliance has removed has replaced some of the removal spots that people had, just giving people even more life gain. It's also just the fact that uh, now people are playing... Uh, are playing Dredge with, with uh, just a really, really, really fast clock. And not to the bonus, single-handed game over. And they have so many ways to go look for it and find it, you know? Well, what I'm I mean, don't get me wrong. Of course, you can skull crack. I, you know, of course, but... Yeah, well, when you move from the three-color version to the two-color version, you go from, like, between four plus two and four plus four skull cracks slash um, a target commands to just four skull cracks, right? So that's a... 
that's a huge that's a huge negative for you when the opponents are adding gnaw to the bone after sideboarding, right? So you don't really get to improve relative to their sideboard. And my only sideboard strategy against the dredge decks was just to add add skull cracks before. And I was always pretty confident with that, but now you have nothing, right? Like, what are you going to add? Like, plowshares? Uh, not plowshares, sorry. Pad the exile for their Golgari Grave Troll? That's not really very exciting. They also, incidentally, and it's not even for you, but they incidentally have, like, typically three collective brutalities after sideboarding. So they actually can, on turn two, kill your Goblin Guide, look at your hand, <laughs> take Skullcrack out of it, and then also drain you for two, and discard Golgari Grave Troll and Stinkweed Imp or Prized Amalgam or something. Yeah, yeah. So while advancing their strategy, they're they're just getting you. Right. Like, I don't think you can beat if they draw Collective Brutality. Like, you can just never win. And if they ever dredge into Gnaw to the Bone, you're in big trouble if you don't hit a skull crack. Yeah, you got to be very careful there. Or that maybe they just have to hope that they forget it's there or something. But that's actually part of the reason why the format has changed so radically in the past uh, the past you know few months. The I mean, prized amalgam and insolent neonate gave dredge so much more raw power. Cathartic reunion. Exactly. That's well. What I'm saying is the insolent neonate and prized amalgam began. The Dredge popularity. Dredge was one of the more popular and successful decks before Cathartic Reunion even got added. Now that it's got the extra juice of just this incredibly powerful enabler, now instead, like, can you, like just think about the power level upgrade of replacing Shriekhorn with Cathartic Reunion. Like, instead of a card that's just, I can mill two cards a turn for the next three turns. Done. <laughs> instead of that, you get to discard two of your dredgers immediately and ancestral recall yeah the like, fact that you're drawing what? cards is just it's cathartic yeah it's like better than breakthrough was in the old legacy dredge decks so anyway i i i mean so they've got this incredible raw power but part of the positioning is the fact that collective brutality gives dredge this incredible combination of removal and discard for slowing down combo decks and a little extra reach meets life gain. It's just so mu so flexible. And they use, to use the Floridian term, they use every part of the Buffalo with with uh, collective brutality. Oh yeah, that's a uh, that's much respect to to that card. And yet, prize still gonna burn. No, no, no. So, dude, they like these people that play mod like that are playing modern right now. They have so much anti-burn technology. It's not a good time. Caleb Durwald won the Caleb won the event with a sweet Bant Spirits deck. I actually own, I think, all these cards. So maybe. What do you... But look at his anti-burn. So he's got two steel of the Godheads in his main deck, man. So as long as that creature is white, it gets plus one, plus one, and has life link. Wait a minute, Geist of Saint Traft is white. And as long as the creature is blue, it gets plus one, plus one, and is unblockable. How do you only have two copies, Caleb Durward? I mean, like, this is just, well, this is the dream, right? Like, no, the reason, so the reason he only has two copies is because he's playing a collected company deck. He's got four copies of collected company. And as we know, you can only play so many, like, you, you, in order for collected company to be the busted blood braid elf that we know it can be, you need to play with a critical mass of hits. And Caleb's deck is already, like, I mean, he already trimmed a path to exile to make room for a steal of the Godhead. <laughs> like, it's not like he, he's not trying. Like, he's really making some serious concessions for, like, for I steal of the Godhead. I actually Drog Skull Captain. I own that. that. That's a card Johnny played in the, the, the top eight of Pro Tour Dark Ascension, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's and this why I bought it, I think. I have that card. So Caleb's deck actually takes advantage of draw of some of the technology that, that Johnny Magic and the rest of the Pantheon, who played uh, Spirits in that Hawaii Pro Tour four years ago, some of the technology that they used. He's got four Drog Skull Captains, which are the one blue, white, 2-2 two -two flyer that uh, gives your other Spirits plus one, plus one, and Hexproof. And Hexproof? Yep. Jeez, I'm crow. How will I so burn he, that creature? 
So he's got the drug skull captain phantasmal image combo. When you play phantasmal image on your drug scale captain, now they're both making each other plus one plus one, but they're also both making each other hex proof. So now your opponent can't kill any of your creatures. That's like cheap. and it gets rid of the phantasmal images drawback. But so one of the things that's so sweet is that drug scale captain making all your spirits hex proof, except for himself. <coughs> It, it makes selfless spirit and rattle chains that much better at protect. Like it gives them a central point to focus around because your opponent's like, well, I can't progress until I kill drug scale captain. But if you have rattle chains and selfless spirit to protect it, and that's to say nothing of both mausoleum uh, wanderer and spell queller to protect it. And the same is true for Geist of St. Traft. This is a deck that has literally 20 spirits in it that can protect your creatures that's like every almost every card that's like <laughs> like dude that's like collective company is going to be able to like no matter what your opponent's doing collective company is real bad well for them. collective company is just first of all that card is always awesome but if yeah. you could just like flip up Maz, like it, the fact that you can coco into spell queller to counter their removal spell drog skull captain to give something hex proof uh, at instant speed i mean Rattle Chains does the same thing, and Rattle Chains can do the same thing off of a collected company. Like, creature removal, like, point creature removal is real bad against this deck. Once they oh, have, yeah. you know, three or four mana. But this deck is also incredibly fast. Remember, even though it's a Bant deck, don't get it twisted. It's not like this is a deck full of counter spells. That said, it has Rattle Chains, Spell Queller. It's got cards, the Wanderer. It's got cards that can counter spells and disrupt your game plan. But this is a deck that hits hard. Your one drops are Noble Hierarch and the Wanderer. Noble Hierarch leads to turn two Geist of St. Draft or Drug Scale Captain or Spell Queller, and a turn three Collected Company or Steel of the Godhead or whatever. And Steel of the Godhead is not just a Geist of St. Draft combo, even though it's disgusting on Geist of St. Draft. It's also just fantastic to put on uh, on your spell queller or drug scale captain, particularly when uh, you you consider that your your spell queller could be by surprise. Like your opponent taps out, plays a card, you spell queller the card, untap, then drop steel of the godhead, and maybe you even th you can even protect the 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 drug scale captain or the spell queller with. The, uh, the the rattle chains of the selfless spirit, and remember, rattle chains lets you play all of your creatures, all of your 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 spirits with flash, so you can actually use drug skull captain as a counter spell, because you can just like if you have a rattle chains in play and your opponent lightning bolts it, you can go okay, I'll flash down my captain. My rattle chains has hexproof. You know, or you can or you can flash down to Geist of Saint Traft on their end step by surprise, and then just attack for 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 freaking like fifteen. What's amazing about this is just like the simple things. You just go like they do their thing. You're like spell coil or your idol on or whatever, right? Then untap while they're tapped and play steal the godhead on spell queller. Just has five toughness now, right? That makes it super annoying to kill, right? And then even if you can kill it, which is probably going to take two cards now that it has five toughness, it's already gotten you for what four? That's like pretty bad, I think. That's like drawing three or four cards against a red deck. Yeah, and it's not like it's, it's not improving after board, right? Because he's already got all these cards to interact with you game one and then steal the godhead to just win. After board, he's getting Vrox Warmonk, man, and Spellskite and Blessed Alliance. Caleb is a guy who gets it, man. Plus, the other two most pop the two most popular decks, like out of the successful ones anyway, uh, Infect and Affinity, which both did uh, reasonable. I mean, Affinity did great, and Infect did uh, you know decent. Uh, but Caleb has three Stony Silence <laughs> and three Rest in Peace. Like he's just not kidding. Well, and that's not even counting stuff like a Sally Pride Mage. Yeah, I think this sex pretty sweet. I don't know, man. I'm just saying that you can do better than burn. Can I? I yeah. Like, I feel like I can't. I mean, I, I'm just saying, like, me as a person, like, where I am in my center of my of my magical life, right? 
Like some people are just one with the lava spike. That, that's that's you know look deep in, look deep inside and what do you see? A three mana. I'm sorry, a three damage sorcery for R. <laughs> that's that's what Did I. Did you see Michael Janney's modern deck? He top eighted with a quote unquote zoo deck, but it's only like loosely a zoo deck in that it's really one of those red green gruel decks. He's just splashing the coddle. But, uh, I mean, he's also got, you know, a little bit of white sideboard action in path. I know this but... deck. Yeah, yeah this is... usually a path main. No, but he's got uh, Experiment 1, Goblin Guy, Curd Ape, Wild Nakato, uh, and then, you know, topping up, like, the going higher on the curve, he's got Tarmogoyf, Burning Tree Emissary, and Reckless Bushwhacker. And this deck just shoves all in and tries to kill you on turn four by attacking. I mean... Gore Clan Rampager is such a baller in this deck. Oh, yeah. It's like, I, I have so much respect for that card. First of all, if you don't know what's coming, because you might not be familiar with this build with Burning Tree Emissary and so forth, like, you can't counterspell it. You know, if, if that's kind of the thing, you're like, oh, well, I'm going to sit back on this thing. You just kill you. And I've played against this deck before where I thought my opponent was in lockdown. I'm like, all right, I, I'm not going to win yet. It's going to take a little while, but he's pretty much paralyzed because I have Eidolon. And, you know, like, if he if he, if he he casts a card or, you know, if he's trying to chain his Burning Tree Emissary strategy or whatever, he's going to put himself too low and I'm just going to kill him. Literal, I've had an opponent just hit their fourth land in their 17 land deck. Actually, it's 18 land with Dryad Arbor, right? And just yep. cast a Gorklan Rampager off the top. And I was just like, what just happened? That doesn't trigger Eidolon. Now I'm on the back foot. Eidolon's going to damage me, and he has a 4-4. Four, four. Right? Right. That Chris card is actually just super baller in this strategy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gore Clan Rampager definitely priced to move. One of my fantasies is playing a Gnarlwood Dryad deck in Modern with Gore Clan Rampager to help enable Delirium. <laughs> yeah. Like, obviously, he gets Creature into the bin. Yes. You know, I mean, obviously, like, instant is a gimme with stuff like Atarka's Command Lightning Bolt Path. And land is a gimme because of all the fetch lands. But you do got to get two more types in the graveyard. And uh, I think you could play, like, like coming up with a couple sorceries is not too bad. If you just want to play, like, uh, you know, a little bit of burn, maybe Gitaxian Probe if you want. I mean, you, there, there, you have a few options. But, like, getting a creature in the bin... I mean, Gorkhan Rampager is a nice way to do it, man. Plus, Trample, plus Death Touch, Mondo Combo. Trample is, I think, the most underrated keyword in Magic. It might be. I think, like, people respect flying, you know. People, oh, Lifelink, huh? They look twice. But pretty, like, Trample, it's, it's like there's no keyword there at all. I think they just don't even consider the presence of Trample. And it gets, yeah. There's no way this deck has Destructive Force, right? That was supposed to be Destructive Revelry. It's Destructive Revelry. Yeah, yeah, it's a typo. It's Destructive Revelry. <laughs> uh, we have uh, super failed in not talking about Modern. We have talked about a lot of Modern. You want to switch to Standard? Yeah, we should talk to Standard. Standard, there, a lot of sweet stuff happened in Standard, including the format getting broken. Yeah, you think the format got broken? There's definitely... I mean, Coelho M4 has like two different kinds of decks in the top eight, right? Yeah, I mean, six copies of White Blue Flash and two copies of Mardu Vehicles. All right, this is the deck I want to talk about first. Providence Top 8. Jackie Wang, Black Red Zombie Madness. This is my favorite deck in Standard right now. That was the only deck in either Grand Prix to, like, besides the big three of White Blue Flash uh, Vehicles or uh, Delirium. There were just 15 copies of those big three, and then Jackie Wang with Black Red Zombies is the only rogue. I uh, I played in a PPTU this weekend, and I played Blue Red Energy. I didn't win. But Ashok Tuturi, I think you probably know him, right? He is yeah. a big uh, vintage guy back in the day. He yeah, was playing this knows. very similar deck, Black Red Zombie Madness, I guess they're calling it. He destroyed the Swiss before just getting... Mulligan to five in the top eight. It's like, I, I played him like for fun a bunch of times. I have never felt so helpless 
in, in a matchup. I just had no idea how I, was, how I was supposed to play it, whether I was supposed to race, whether I was supposed to remove his creature. Removing his creatures was a disaster, right? That was a complete disaster. And one of the things that is so compelling about this deck to me is that it validates one of the things that we were talking about last week in Standard, which is why is Void Shatter inferior to Scatter to the Winds right now? If you look at this deck, there are two cards in particular that are real important going to the graveyard, right? One of them is Haunted Dead. The other one's Prize Amalgam. He can't even cast Prize Amalgam. He doesn't have the ability to cast Prize Amalgam. How much does that invalidate the presence of cards like Void Shatter? There's, graveyards are relevant. I'm sorry, it's super relevant, but countering cards going to the graveyard doesn't do anything. I'm still playing Void Shatter some of the time. Uh, I don't think it's great, but like... The key is playing Void Shatter in a deck that is not the, the ceremonious rejection is not going to be good against. Because like if you have one Void Shatter in your uh, your white blue flash cyborg, that's fine. I personally don't. I would rather have like Spell Shrivel or something like like uh, like Yuki, just because I think the casting it is a little hard, but. At the end of the day, if you want to counterspell like that, it's still counter scrap heap scrounger. And the people where you want the, the void shatter are not the people that have the ceremonious rejection. And it's not like ceremonious rejection is like the card that an Aetherworks first of all, Aetherworks Marvel has completely fallen off the map. But uh, I, I mean think relative that, to the Pro Tour, yeah. From first to blastish. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's like it was like the most popular deck at the Pro Tour by a fair bit, and or one of the most popular, depending on how you merge the archetypes. And uh, it was almost non-existent in both Grand Prix on day two, both Grand Prix. Uh, I think this black red deck is is decent. I, I think, think it's decent. great, not decent. It's got like a pretty good beatdown. It's not as fast, obviously, as the black red deck that's got. Uh, you know the apprentice and stuff like that so it doesn't have like two power on 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 first turn or anything as much or kind of key to the city based aggro in, in main deck but it's so inevitable it's got like a pretty good beat down with low casting cost guys in a smuggler's copter but it just weaves together so well it's got cathartic reunion it's got smuggler's copter it's got insolent leonate it's got lightning axe and fiery temper and they're just just putting Prize of Malcolm or Haunted Dead into the graveyard. It's just like, it's like a beatdown deck that's just flipping Voldaire and Pariah into play, you know, getting the bodies on Haunted Dead and Prize of Malcolm and the token, and then just all of a sudden as a huge guy while taking out your team. Or, you know, you're just like sitting there, you're like, oh, did I stabilize? Or like, end of turn, buyback, uh, Haunted Dead, take six. You know, like the... The black blue decks that were doing this before, you know, that had kind of like an emerge sub theme or something, they were not putting the same kind of life point pressure on you that this deck is. And it can go like unlicensed disintegration route. I was super impressed by the ability of this deck to interact with control style strategies by bringing in distended mind bender. What kind of. Oh, yeah. And to collective combo? brutality. Yeah. And to transgress the mind. Like, what There's kind no of. There's no question. That's a lot of discard. combo is Haunted Dead or. Or prized amalgam, or even scrap heap scrounger, into distended mindbender. That's so strong. Like, I I think this deck is. I think it's just aces. I, if I if I were gonna play this weekend, I would try real hard to get the cards on it. The only thing I disagree with is this is such a twenty four land deck. I feel like Jackie Wang was cheating at at twenty three, and the twenty fourth land should be a guy Ridge sanitarium in my opinion. I think that's reasonable. Like, it's just, it, you need operating mana in this deck. You need, like, extra mana to pay for your Haunted Dead. If you're discarding Voldaren Pariah, it's not free. You need to be able to pay for it. You know, you know, just random mana what are you availability cutting for, for scrounge. Are you cutting the one on license disintegration? I think I'd cut a Lightning Axe. Man, you're so greedy cutting one of these spells with, uh, that, that actually deal with Archangel Avacyn. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, maybe you don't care that much, but, man... White blue flash is completely dominating, despite the fact that everybody knows. Like it was the best deck at the Pro Tour, and now it's the best deck and also the most popular deck. I mean, maybe people will adjust. Maybe 
Like, but part of the reason I'm sympathetic to Black Red is that I think it's going to fly a little under the radar. Even though it put one in the top eight, I think the people are going to be so fixated on White Blue Flash and that they, they've got Mardu vehicles and Delirium is rounding out the top three that I think that enough people are going to fly under the radar uh, or that it's going to fly under the radar for enough people. And a lot of people are not going to take into consideration how much play there is to it. If you don't have a lot of games of experience against Black Red, you are in for a rude awakening when you learn the intricacies of how Voldaren Pariah or Haunted Dead or Prized Amalgam or, or, uh, or Distended Mindbender. Like when you see how some of these cards interact and operate, because it's not necessarily obvious. It's so weird the way the deck plays out sometimes. Yeah, it's, it's really weird Like because they, it's a kind of deck that could go like, Crypt Breaker into Scrap Creep Scrounger into, you know, like, just beat down, beat down, and then just gets a copter online, and you know, it's not the fastest beat down, but you're you're taking damage, right? And you're like, oh, I gotta, I gotta figure out how to stabilize. And then all of a sudden, it's this card advantage value engine that every single turn, they're drawing three cards. And you're like, I don't understand how I'm supposed to combat this guy. He's just crewing Smuggler's Copter with a spirit token, you know? And then just getting me and discarding fiery temper or discarding another prize amalgam and just drawing into what he needs it's it's real strong um but you're I right do, I, go ahead I, I was gonna say i do i do think you might be interested in uh one of the many many white blue flash decks to uh top eight this past weekend anthony lee top eighted with a white blue variant with a, a little twist just a little twist he had two scrap heap scroungers main and two scrap heap scroungers in his sideboard. That was his only black. And he powered it off of just four concealed courtyard and three sunken hollow. So he's got 12 basics to help keep the sunken hollows untapped. And part of it is that he, he went down on, he did not play Westvale Abbey and he, he only played two prairie streams because he doesn't have any doubles really. Like he has no double cost besides Gideon and Archangel, but he's playing lots of white mana. He just isn't playing that much blue because he doesn't. He has no blue double anywhere. But the thing about Scrap Heap Scrounger Splash, even off of just source seven black sources, is that he can cast it for colorless straight up. No problem. And then he can bring it back later, eventually, when he draws a black source. If he didn't draw one anyway, you know, because like often he just will. But that extra Scrap Heap Scrounger action gave him uh, a particularly potent weapon against control decks. Now, uh, it is notable that control kind of fell off the map this past weekend. Not entirely. It just dropped away. You know, it was like so strong a performing of archetype at the Pro Tour. But this weekend, I think everybody was like really gunning for like uh, Carlos and Shota's style of control decks, you know, the Just Guy and Grixis control decks that... Uh, it was really the white blue flash deck that was the most successful macro archetype at the Pro Tour, and sure enough, this weekend it just dominated. Like every nine and one or better deck at the Pro Tour was white blue flash, right? Right. Yeah. Because, well, the deck feasts on on Marvel, and and Marvel was so popular, like they just have no interaction capability against a a spell queller in game one, right? Like if you if they just go for their thing and you have spell queller, they're just getting destroyed. Yeah, but it's not even with Aetherworks Marvel completely falling off the falling off the map. If you look at the day two of uh, of the the two Grand Prix, they were they were thirty they were God thirty percent of the day two metagame. That's like I don't know. That's like a very very meaningful thing, and and as if that was uh, as if that wasn't enough. I mean, like day two of Kuala Lumpur. White blue flash was was thirty four point seven percent of day two, but it was fifty one point three percent of the top eight weighted by finish. Like it's like if you just look at flash and Mardu, uh, that was like a full three quarters. It's crazy just looking at the list. It's just flash, Mardu, Mardu, flash, 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 Mardu, flash, Mardu. That's like real lopsided, man. I mean, I love the white blue deck. And, like, much respect to it. I love those four Gideons that are being played in most of these versions. Yeah, basically everybody plays four Gideons for the most part. Uh, 
There was there was like uh, Marcus O played uh, a kind of an unusual variant where he just moved the Gideons to the sideboard so that he could play a Gisela main deck. Whereas, you know, about half of people sideboard Gisela in some number, but he just wanted to play the Gisela's main. I prefer him in the sideboard. I mean, they're different, right? Like, I think that the reason I think Gideon is so awesome is if you draw it up on paper, especially when you're playing against control, the number of cards that are actually that meaningful in the white blue flash deck are not that's not a huge number of cards like there are a couple they're they're really meaningful but not an overwhelming number like you could take a lot of hits from thraben and specter before it starts mattering cards like reflector major aren't very good against you but then at some point they've got to tap some mana in order to interact or they're eventually going to lose and then you just have this opening to resolve gideon and once you resolve they are in a lot of trouble when the white oh, yeah. blue flash deck resolves gideon in a way that None of the black or black red or red white based. Well, I mean, I guess red white based, depending on which version decks can pressure them, right? Like they're and all of a sudden now the game is only about that Gideon and whether or not they can. Yeah, play. I mean, like when you're playing a Jeff Sky deck that wants to torrential Gear Hulk a Glimmer of Genius, you are not equipped for Gideon. No, you just you can't get in. I mean, it, it just makes two twos blocks you. Like it's it's horrible. Uh, you need to have, like, Nibblus or something online, and that's only in a sideboarded game for only certain versions, or you're just not going to not gonna be able to. And the Grixis decks have a lot of trouble playing very many Ruinous Paths. You know, I mean, they do play them some, but they're, they're not good in the format. <laughs> I mean, they're bad against most of these creatures. I actually like this Marcus O version, um, not about the, the Giselles, but I think that if the format is going to be, like, largely... Uh, white blue defined right now thalia heretic cathar seems pretty awesome that's the one i like i really like his thalia heretic cathars that part is sweet if archangel avison's coming into play tapped she's not going to do as much damage if any rando creatures coming into play tapped can't crew this torrential gear hulk yeah torrential gear hulk comes into play tapped i i saw some stuff at the pptq that i just would never have imagined was going to matter and it was a green-white deck. I know you played green-white at the Pro Tour. You probably didn't have a lot of these cards, I'm thinking, in it. But this, I saw a green-white deck just completely demolish an Aetherworks Marvel deck. And I thought Marvel was a huge advantage against green-white. But having Thalia, Heretic, of Car was pretty good. So even when they got Emrakul, like, they couldn't destroy you with it, right? Because, you know, a lot of the time, it's about, like, you take their turn and then you run their best guys into your guys. Well, their Emrakul comes into play tapped. That was pretty bad. But then this other card that was awesome was... Um, which is it that the green white angel that you can't be targeted? Yeah. Just cast that guy and you just super undo a big a big chunk of what of what uh Marvel can do. And I was like, wow, this is incredibly impressive. I, I couldn't believe how yeah, how we, meaningful these green white creatures were. Yeah, when you have her down, the five five flyer for five, they can't emerald you. I mean they can play Emerald, but they don't get to take your turn. Yeah, I mean, like, I have a 13-13, which is really powerful, right? But that's nobody plays it just because it's a 13-13. They do it to destroy you. And, you know, you just get your turn. You're like, ho-hum, here's a stasis snare. And, <laughs> and that's it. Yeah, because all these white-blue flash decks play four stasis snares. And it's actually very meaningful. Uh, like, it's worth noting that Reflector Mage, it sounds a little, you know, it's a little funny to think of. But Reflector Mage is actually very strong against Emrakul. Yeah. You see, when you play these white-blue flash decks and you have four Reflector Mage and four Stasis Snare, neither, like, Stasis Snare can only hit an opponent creature. And Reflector Mage can only bounce an opponent's creature. And both of them are mandatory. So if your opponent plays, like, if they play Emrakul, like, if on turn four they Aetherworks Marvel and Emrakul you, there's, like, a real cap on how much damage they can even do to you. Because, like, they get to look at your hand and you draw a card, but then what? None of your cards can even target yourself. They can, like, eat one of your creatures, but, like, they can't really even, like, do anything to you. And uh, and then on your next turn, you can just Reflect Your Mage, their Emrakul, or Stasis Snare. Yeah, I... One of the things that I really like about the direction the white decks have moved in this format is how much people are embracing Stasis Snare over declaration in stone so i feel like yep. before the pro tour it was all all about declaration in stone is the first line on on white anti-creature defense 
Yep. And now it's moved so much to Stasis Snare. And Stasis Snare is great against Emrakul. I, 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 I felt like it in, in testing a fair amount. I just I couldn't put it the right words against it, but I would just draw a declaration so I'd never want to cast it. My opponent's creatures were so bad so often. Yep. Uh, it is worth noting also that Stasis Snare exiles the uh, ex exiles Scrap Heap Scrounger. You know? Oh, that's good. Like, little stuff like that matters. That adds up a lot. So you but like this, you like white blue with scrap heap scrounger? Is that something I should No, I should no, I don't like the sc I don't like the scrounger. I don't like the scrounger. I think that it is cute against control, but I just don't think it's a great time for control this week still. I, I, I like a deck so the main deck I like, if I were gonna play in a tournament I mean I said this last week, but it's the same thing. I would play almost the exact same thing that Yuki uh that Yuki played. His white blue flash, Ichikawa. He played yep. um so he played four Reflector Mage, four uh, Spell Queller, four Archangel, four Inspector, four Selfless Spirit, four Smuggler's Copter, four Stasis Snare, four Gideon, and most people played that package. Uh, he just didn't ch cut on, you know, cut any of the super cards. But then uh, there's always these three discretionary spots. He used two Rattle Chains and a Declaration in Stone. Uh, I think I would play either two Rattle Chains and a Negate, or one Rattle Chains and two Negates. How about just Thalia there? Uh, I don't know. I, I, maybe, but I, I mean, I could be convinced, but based on what I know at the moment, I'm still, I, if you want to play one negate, one Thalia, one Rattle Chains, I, see, I, I think see. Rattle Chains isn't that great in this deck. I don't think it's that great either. It's just that you've got four Stasis Snare, four Reflector Mage, and four Spell Queller. That's 12 threes already, man. And then the number of twos you have is, like, you have just four Selfless Spirit, four Smuggler's Copter, and four Activate Your Thraven Inspector. <laughs> That's not that bad, but, like, it's not that good. Is is four Gisela in the sideboard the right number of Gisela? I personally play two, but I could see arguments for two, three, or four. I'm He's a... going all the way to play Bruna. Once you're going to play that whole package, but... I think I'm a two person, even if I played Bruna. Bruna's still good. I'm... I'm not gonna play. Yeah, I wouldn't play Bruna though. So the the list that I'm the list that I'm advocating is uh, uh, I actually like um, the God what the well the main deck just like Yuki's or like but with the the negate stuff that I mentioned. Yep. But the uh, in the sideboard I like a mixture of of uh, a fair bit of permission you know i like uh two summary dismissal because i think aetherworks marvel is going to start to make a comeback and emrakul in general showing up in like uh the delirium decks uh, i think two ceremonious rejection but i could be swayed to only play one just for i just speed. think that speed against the vehicle decks uh one dispel one spell shrivel uh and then i um I, I really I like two Gisela. Uh, I wouldn't really play too many more. I think two Gisela is a good number. Uh, the the Jace Unraveler Secrets. I'm a big fan of this one. I like playing two actually. I think that the ability to play against these weird mid range decks or control decks is actually like pretty valuable. I, but I also just think I, I think the card is like actually pretty reasonable in the mirror. I played that card in Blue Green Crush. Uh, in, you know, I tested a little in main deck, and I played it in sideboard a lot. I thought it was really thoroughly awesome. I, I yeah. was never unhappy to have that card in play. Uh, and it's cool here. Like you can do stuff that's a little, a little bit off off script. Like resetting your Linval of the Preserver is probably pretty good. You know that that's pretty good. You know, or resetting a Archangel Abyssin. Things that like we wouldn't normally think about. And then uh, everybody plays some sp some cheap spot removal in their sideboard. Uh, myself included, the, the mix I like is two Fragmentize, two Declaration in Stone, and a Blessed Alliance. And all of this is, of course, contingent on there being two Negates in the main deck. If I was going to play, like, one Negate, one Declaration in the main deck, I would just play one less Declaration in the sideboard and one more Negate. You know? So here's a question. Yeah. When is Negate not good? I feel like it's pretty good even against the aggro decks. You can counter some of their vehicles. You can counter, you know, sometimes they have Gideon. It's, a uh... I don't know. I was siding it in against fast decks. And so it, it's a card that typically 
you know, we, we think of as being a sideboard card, but, you know, you're just talking about playing it in the main deck now. I, mean, I could see, like, two and two being right, or I, I could just go crazy. What if four negates main deck is right for some decks? I would be really surprised. You see, uh, to begin with, uh, I don't like negate against black-red. Like, you, it has some targets, but it's super awkward to try to, like, if your plan is, like, I guess, negate. Wait, I guess black, red, beatdown, black, red, madness Graveyard. zombies. Yeah, so, like, obviously oh, the dream is to hit, that deck, yeah. well, the dream is to hit Smuggler's Copter. That's when it actually looks good, is if you're on the play and you keep your two mana open and you can negate Smuggler's Copter. But, like, if you're just all in on negate, it's so easy to end up in spots where most of the cards the other person's playing that are threatening are are not going to be hit by it. Like, the fact that you can't negate Archangel Addison, Ishkana Graph Widow, Verderous Gear Hulk, Torrential Gear Hulk, like, you can't negate most of these cards. Like, the 3-3 the, 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 the three, three for um, the vehicle decks, the their legend that's so sweet. Uh, I, uh, I, Depla? Yeah, and you can't you can't uh, you can't negate the uh, you know neither the bristling hydra nor the uh, the the doubling the brawler uh, the pummel brawler, the pummel yeah I just think that it's it, I think it's good and I don't think it's crazy to imagine playing four negates because there are targets different places I just think that it's more likely that a control deck would be interested in playing more negates. Whereas, like, if you're playing, like, a white-blue flash deck, you only have so many discretionary spots, slots, and creatures are a big deal. This format is, it's got so many great creatures in it. You know, you don't want to draw three negates against somebody who's got Grim Flare. Fair enough. What do you, I don't talk, know. talk to me about Westvale Abbey. This is a card that's showing up, like, some, some decks even play two, right? Right. I personally, I like one, but I also think that zero is fine. It depends, really, if you're going to be greedy and try to play stuff like Void Shatter in your sideboard. Uh, I'm playing one Westvale Abbey to provide a little bit of a... It's just a little bit more power if the game drags out. You Most of the time you draw it, you're not even going to use it. But it just gives you one more option. Um, I, I don't think it's a big deal if you play it or not. It, it, it's the way this deck plays out. It's more that the opportunity cost isn't that high because your colors are not actually very hard. You're not very strained. But the objective is actually just to use it as like a Vidu Ghazi. Yeah. Yeah. Just as a bad Vidu Ghazi. Like a bad just token making Kelder and Outpost type of land. Wow. I guess, I mean, I, this deck isn't really very well set up to flip it. You know what's an interesting. Uh, deck that can flip it though is black green delirium yeah no in, in black green delirium you could actually flip it it's just that it doesn't really come to that because like when you've triggered ishkana those aren't the games where you need the extra help the games where you actually need the extra help are the games where you can't grasp on two on time you know or you're like playing a traverse into grasp sort of like I mean, oh, that is what, hella awkward. <laughs> right, right. So, like, Westville Abbey does not help. I just, I don't think that it helps the the games that matter. Let's talk about these uh, Ishkana Graph Widow decks, though. I was actually surprised uh, over in in Providence, the huge resurgence of Black Green Delirium in the United States, and in fact, like retro Black Green Delirium, right? So this is like nothing, oh yeah, nothing like the deck that Efro played. No, and the deck that Epro played was, like, a great call for that weekend. But, like, this weekend, you really needed to be, like, it's just there's a very different target. Like, uh, Ishkana Graph Widow is one of the best cards against um, against Blue-White Flash. They can't spell Queller it, and it gums up the whole game. Like, if, you're, if your plan is, like, Rattle Chains and Selfless Spirit and Thraven Inspector, somebody drops an Ishkana, and uh, <laughs> you're just brick-walled. Yeah, it's like your creatures are all a joke, right? Their tokens are as big as your creatures. Right. And then, like, Mind Rack Demon making a comeback 
it's because it outclasses uh, Archangel Avacyn and company. You know, like you don't want to attack with a Kalidus into somebody who has an Archangel Avacyn. You just you don't want to do it. That's not where you want to be. And you still play Kalidus, but you're just you're playing a split so that you have a little bit more. You have some options. Well, it depends. I, I'm looking at Dave Shields' deck right now. So Dave's got four Liliana the Last Hope, right? Which is, I guess, used to be the number everyone played. And four Grim Flare, but three Ishkana Graph Widow. That's the thing that's really surprising to me. I thought that with Kaladesh, that we were going to see a real substantial move from Ishkana Graph Widow to Verder's Gear Hulk. And we did. It's consistently, though, in, you know, moving forward for Black Green Delirium decks. And here's a deck where there's no Verder's Gear Hulk, and he's just really... Here are all my Ishkanas that I own, right? They're in my deck. And then he's got, like, this Pilgrim's Eye Descended Mindbender sub theme. He's got, he's got it all going on. Put an artifact in the graveyard. So you might be interested in the even more retro, teched-out version of Black Green Delirium used by uh, the Grand Prix winner in Providence. Uh, is it Yichen Wang? Yichen Wang, yeah. yeah. So... At first blush, it might not be obvious just how weird of a build this is. But when you look a little closer, you see he doesn't have any Grim Flares. He I literally even... cut the Sacred Cow Grim Flare for Sylvan Advocate. He was the only one in the, uh, among the top Delirium decks. He's Sylvan Advocate and Tireless Tracker. This is like a green-white deck. This deck is so retro. He's got a play set of Sylvan Advocate with no Grim Flare. He's got... Uh, he's got one Noxious Gear Hulk with no Verderous Gear Hulk. He's got two Ishkana. He's only got 13 creatures total. He's got main deck transgress the mind. He's got dead weight and to the slaughter alongside murder. <laughs> All in the same deck. All in the same deck. And that's not even counting for Grasp of Darkness. He's got Blighted Fen. He decided he would play a Carless Land. Oh, I forgot about Blighted Fen. That was like one of my Blighted favorites. Fen to go get with his Traverse the Ulvenwald sometimes. He's got, you know, because one of the cool things that that actually does is that it gives him an answer that he can go get to solve certain types of difficult problems, you know, like Ulamog. Because you can, sometimes you just Blighted Fen. Because, like, sometimes if you're putting enough pressure on them, they uh, have you to log your tireless tracker and your Sylvan Advocate you or don't, something. You don't need to convince me on Blighted Fen. I remember my Black Red deck had, like, four Blighted Fen. <laughs> I love Blighted Fen. Yep. And you then just tutor for it. Yep. And then on the sideboard, he's got a second Amrickle of the Promised End. Because sometimes you got to go bigger. He's got Planeswalkers, which is nothing too fancy. You know, Obnixilis and Nissa, Vital Force. A lot of people do that. But then he's actually, he's got... Uh, he's got three appetite for the unnatural. That's pretty standard. He's got two flame tendrils though. That How many was people a, even play the sweepers now? That was like the standout to me. I won two flame tendrils in, in F and M last month. So that's a deck that you can just, <laughs> just throw it right in. Yeah, I own two, and yep. they're foil. Yep. So anyway, I think this is a sweet, sweet list. It's so old school. <laughs> I'm like, not. This is like Chuck Taylor's man. Can you imagine like? Uh, you know, Bron Bon and Carmelo coming out with, with like you know, some real old school canvas sneakers. That's what this is. They would look good. <laughs> Dude, he's they, got. They could wear those with their suits right after the game, too. And this is a list that's actually trying to delirium harder. You know, like it's going to trigger its Ishkanograph Widows regularly. And it's going to cast Emrakul a little sooner than most. Even though he's playing delirium, he's got Vessel of Nascency. He's taking a page out of the, like, old school, old school. You know, he's already filled four grapple with the past, and then he also plays two Vessel of Decency, like some of the ramp decks, some yeah, of the, the emerge decks. decks. Right. This is this is a really clever, really, really clever list, which is no Grim Flares, no Verter's Gearhawks. Why, 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 why use such things? Well, the thing is, he doesn't have the one drop. Yep, but doesn't that, have that to either. To me, that is the sacredest of the sacred cows. Really? Yeah. I mean, I don't every, think most, most people that use the one drop. No, nah, most people that use the one drop. Yeah, but that's because he's playing Verderous Gear Hulk, and even Ephra only played two. I think that guy's sweet. Yeah, I don't think anybody plays the, the one drop too much. I mean, I guess Maxim Bellinger played two copies in his sideboard. 
Um, but uh, almost nobody. Uh, yeah, I don't think very many people play play that guy right now. I, it's 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 just that that's not the problem that Delirium needs solved at the moment. I mean, this is the what what position in the well, oh man, Max and Bellinger's deck is it's crazy. Two filigree familiar main deck. So filigree familiar has taken a spot of Pilgrim's, Pilgrim's Eye, Eye, I guess, yep. setting up Descended Mindbender. Maybe we could just how retro can you go? Can we go so retro that we're like it's not even that retro, right? We're talking about like one Pro Tour backwards. Is like Teamer emerge a deck again? If this kind of deck is no. a deck again. No? Hard no? <laughs> maybe, maybe. I don't know. It's performed really horrible so far, and I haven't seen any innovations or additions that seem to help its positioning. So, like, But should the te- these decks be getting shredded by red-white vehicles? Like, that's, that's the, the only conclusion I can come to. Like, the reason that these decks were not popular going into the Pro Tour was because, I guess, Yichin Wang beat Osip 2-0. I guess it depends what build you have, but Osa beat uh, Max and Bellinger 2-0. Yeah, I mean, so Wang has, uh, you know, eight removal spells main deck, and then he also has a bunch of cheap removal sweepers and ap- three appetite for the unnaturals, and you just sit and you just play a little bit of a grindy game. You're like, okay, I'll play a removal spell, removal spell, removal spell, and then hopefully, like, Kalidas or Ishkina can do enough, you know? Like, he just plays, like, The Rock. Uh, I, I think it's going to be close either way, but like, you're not going to get shredded. I feel like, I feel like Descended Mindbender's got to be one of the best cards in this strategy. I think people should play more. Like, I'm just thinking about the different setups. You just go like three drop into Descended Mindbender. It's like very effective against beatdown decks. Like, you can take their ace, and then you have a five five, and you and you got value probably on the exchange. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I, I don't think Distended Mindbender is at his best against Beatdown. I think that guy's more of a anti-control, anti-Aetherworks Marvel type of thing. Oh, it's obviously there for, for control. It's awesome against control. But I just think, like, the Beatdown decks aren't very well optimized for it, among other things, right? Like, if you... If you um, I guess it doesn't matter that much if you, uh, if you stay to snare, because even if, they, even if they get you with Appetite for the Unnatural, it's not like they get the triggers again. Yeah, because you'd have those both of those cards in against them after sideboarding, I think. Appetite for the unnatural. Yeah, I don't know about for the sure. mindbender. I'm advocating for it though. I think he's, yeah, I think he's a good man. So uh, it's interesting to me the divide between the the vehicles decks on the two different uh, in the two different GPs, the two different hemispheres. Over in uh, Kuala Lumpur, the uh, it was Mardu yeah. all over the place. Mardu most successful, most popular. Um, and, uh, not even just real Mardu, there was a split. I mean, some people just played Mardu, but some people did like, uh, you know, like Li Shi Tian at the, uh, Pro Tour and used four Aether Hub for, uh, you know, they convert four of their mountains into four Spire Bluff Canal and have four Aether Hub and then three Cultivator's Caravan in order to splash a sideboard of, uh, Ceremonious Rejection. It is a sweet curve, right? Like Cultivator's Caravan into Ceremonious Rejection, or just using the Aether Hub that they don't realize is also producing blue. But uh, in the U.S., everybody, see, not everybody, but like White Red seemed to be more popular. And it was a little different of a White Red, you know, like only eight one drops instead of 12. Like Osip played uh, Four Selfless Spirit, and Bosley played Four Selfless Spirit, and, uh, and they both had like. PNLR and Depla, and they they actually went higher. You know, I mean, Ian had a, a single Archangel Avison, and Osip actually played two copies. Well, so, and that's has, the part I love. Well, he has like no Sky Sovereign in the main deck, right? And no Gideons, so he's putting all of his expensive stuff into those two Archangel Avisons, basically. He's got like a third he, Fleet Wheel Cruiser. Yeah, he's the, also got three Fleet Wheel Cruisers. Well, you say a third, but he's also got a second and a first. Fleet Wheel Cruiser because, is like a, I think a pretty stock card in red white, isn't it? No, well, only in straight red white. The Mardu decks never play it. They play Cultivator's Caravan instead. That's sort of the fundamental difference between these decks is if they're built around Cruiser or Caravan. Sky Sovereign has been most has been widely uh, relegated to the sideboard 
and with good reason. I don't think it's like a great time for a main deck Sky Sovereign. But, but I don't know. I, I agree. I, I like the Archangel Avisons more than like Gideon in this deck. You know, I think the Archangel Avisons are just real smooth. See, I like the Gideon in the board, but I love Gideon in this deck. And I, you know, maybe it's just our, our biases. Like I'm always biased towards Gideon, and like all, you know, every time we talk about any decks, I'm like, but what about those Gideons, Patrick? <laughs> well, <laughs> here's another case when when the opponent interacts with you. Gideon would be the perfect card to play, you know. I, I, that's always my answer, right? And you know, when you were playing, when you were playing Green White at the Pro Tour, I mean, you activated Gideon and then just put four plus one plus one counters on it, didn't you? You did that. That was the no. thing you did. No. 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 no it's not really how it goes. You can. That's a thing you can do. I always think about it, but it's never right. <laughs> Why would you put the plus one plus one counters on Gideon? He's already indestructible, and they're already going to block him because he's already a five five. So you're gonna, you're going to spread him on the the Gear Hulk itself and the two two, so they're all great threats, all all at least five five. Yeah, you know, like the most common thing I'm going to do is put three on the two two and one on the Gear Hulk. Call yeah, it a day. so it's three five fives. Right. right, but I also I like putting counters on things that can actually block, not things that if they get attacked. I will just lose the counters for no value. <laughs> Forever. <laughs> like, Gideon is the worst creature in the deck to put counters on. Because of Smuggler's Copter. Uh, just because of the fact that it can't block, and also they're going to block it anyway, and it doesn't have evasion. Well, those but are it's lot, cool. Those are a lot it's of cute. Reasons, but it's so the, big. Here's the, the reason, here's the one part that I like about putting counters on Gideon. It, just, it didn't come up for me, but it came up for me a lot in testing. Is the uh, turn four Gideon when you have no creatures on the table and you play the two two? Sometimes they kill the two two, or you block with it because they're like, okay, f you know, they're like Fleet Wheel Cruiser or whatever. But like, or you just trade. They're just trading off. Or at some point, sometimes you play Gideon and they sweep the board. You know, like you played a Gideon and you had already played an Inspector on one and. Maybe, uh, you know, a uh, like, like the two -two Servant of the guy. Conduit. Yeah. yeah, Servant of the Conduit on two, and then a Gideon on three. And then they play, like, a Radiant Flames or something. I don't know. They sweep the board, and then you go Verderous Gear Hulk, my Gideon attack for nine. Boom. Yeah, they're in bad times. If, I mean, if they're, if they're Radiant flames you for, for those two value creatures when you have a Gideon in play, that was probably a game you were going to win. <laughs> I don't think you need the, the Verdus Gear Hulk back up that much. Yeah. So, I don't know, man. Uh, one last thing I did want to uh, throw by you, though. What do you think about bringing Aetherworks back? Marvel? Yeah. I mean... Did you see Yuya's Aetherworks Marvel deck? I, so, I, Yuya finished 17th at the Pro Tour, not even the Grand Prix, the Pro Tour, with a Bant Aetherworks deck. Oh, I did see that deck. I did, yeah. Yeah, so uh, the twist with his is the use of Descend Upon the Sinful as a uh, as an additional hit. Because when you Descend Upon the Sinful against a lot of these aggro decks on turn four, you are devastating them, particularly since you can get Delirium like pretty regularly. And then you sweep the board, exile their stuff. It beats Self of Spirit, but you're also getting a 4-4. Four -four. But... You can. This is this. This is a deck that's trying to set up to marvel a second time if you need. You know, like it's less explosive and devastating. And then he also had a bunch of Tamios as a virtual like hit. But uh, I actually was wondering if we could put Ishkana in uh, in in this style of uh, Aetherworks deck. Well, like the same thing that you're saying for for Descend Upon the Sinful qualify for for Ishkana, right? Yeah, and it's actually super easy. You could actually just go like, you know, depending on the game, right? You just go like Marvel and then Ishkana, and not even tap the Marvel, like make them beat you square. Like that's a thing you could do. And then when they do that, then you can go get your Emrakul or whatever. Yep. You you not into it? Uh, I'm thinking about it for so. The, here's the here's the thing. Given the popularity of blue white, I'm a little I'm a little queasy about this. But Yuya's deck, he's got, like, his own spell quellers. That's kind of cool. Servant of the Conduit's super cool, right? Like, it, it it gives you energy, and then you can, 
I guess you can use that energy to go cast your Marvel, right? Yep. Uh, hey, did did you see Yuta Takahashi's white blue flash deck? I did. He had Thalia's Lancers in the sideboard. A man after your own heart. I mean, I like all of these things that you're saying. All these words. Like, not even just the... He, like, obviously he had Bruna and uh, a bunch of Gisellas, but he cut the fourth Gisella for one Thalia's Lancer because he just wants to go a little bigger. Uh, the card's really good. Um, if you can, you know, you've, you've talked about a lot of things that you can do with it. Like, you can get, like, Thalia's Lancers, go get Bruna, right? Trade off the Thalia's Lancers, then Bruna back to Thalia's Lancers, then go get Gisella. Then, you know, there's all kinds of other stuff, right? You can go get Archangel Avis in this way. You don't have to do the obvious thing with it, right? I, I mean, I love the curve where you go, like, Lancers into Gisella, then Gisella go get, you know, go get Bruna there, and then they're, like, kind of damned if you do, damned if you do the other thing. It's, uh, it's good. I mean, the card advantage is just fantastic. I think it just depends, right? Like, a lot of the time when you're playing Gisela in a non-Bruna package, you want Gisela for the speed, right? Like, you're in a matchup where Gideon would be bad on four because the opponent plays a Smuggler's Copter or, you know, other Flyers just going to get killed. But Gisela in the same spot, like, stop signs the Smuggler's Copter unless they've got something else and is super thr- Like, if you're going to untap and get, like, a straight turn when you potentially could have Spell Shrivel or, or Spell Queller like, the next turn, like, the Gisela might just single-handedly take over the game. And when you're, when you're playing that kind of game, it's all about speed, and you really just want your four to be four, and you don't want Thalia's Lancers in that spot, right? I mean, unless you're going to play more than four copies. But if you're the kind of person who's playing Gisela into Bruna, and you want to play, like, this long game powerhouse game, because it's actually a very compelling set of cards against control, right? Um, if you just lace these cards value, 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 one after the other, it's, it's tough. The, the control decks have to answer each and every one of these threats while giving you openings to do something big. You know, they're just very good. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe it's awesome to play it on turn eight when you have Spell Shrivel or Spell Queller. Seems a little greedy to me. I mean, the games are going to go long, right? Like, they're going to answer all your threats. It's true. Hey, uh, did you see Julian Wiles play deck, the 10th place deck from GP Providence? This is one of the coolest decks of the weekend there's a four color energy aggro deck and it's not like an energy aggro like uh, one of those combo like pummeler type of decks this is just straight up like his uh so no one drops at all his two drops i mean of course no, he's got four tune with ether right but i'm at other creatures so yep. his two drops he's got uh four long tusk cub i know you love that guy four like servant that. of the conduit four voltaic brawler and then at three, he's got four Spell Queller, three Whirler Virtuoso, and then two Reflector Mage and two Tireless Tracker. Yeah. Looking almost like a Coco deck. And then he's got four Woodland Wanderer. When was the last the, time that, is, that, that guy is the beatdown of this deck. And three Tamiyo. And then he's also got two Verter's Gearhulks up top and just two Harness Lightning to uh, round out the removal package. And his sideboard, obviously, taking advantage of the fact that he's got colors all over the place. You know, he's got Ceremonies of Rejection and Negate. Plus, he's got some uh, Reflector Mage, and he's got a little bit of burn. And he's got to respect any man with an Evolving Wilds in his sideboard. That's so gangster. It's so, I mean, like, so, so, so great. Uh, Just Ceremonies of Rejection and Negate. Yeah, I love this deck. It's spectacularly cool. The Miser's Blossoming Defense, because they don't know. Two well, Jace Unraveler of Secrets. Why not have a Planeswalker? Let's go. Let's go the other way. I think I'm in love, actually. I'm, Dude, I'm isn't looking, this deck sweet? I don't own any. T- I, I'm thinking like, how quickly can I assemble this deck? I don't own any Tamiel Field Researchers. Should I own? Dude, Whirler Virtuoso, I think, is very underrated. The card is so effective against like the Rattle Chain Selfless Spirit style of decks, and you can actually like meaningfully race some. Like you can just buy yourself so much time. But then the big thing, the part that I think is just so cool, Woodland Wanderer is a 6-6 Vigilance Trample. Like, we were talking about how underrated Trample is. If your opponent's playing a deck full of Haunted Deads and their big plan (laughs) is that they're going to be like, okay, I'll use my Haunted Dead and my Spirit Token because I want to block your stuff, they're not messing with a 6-6 Vigilance Trample, and it's blocking their stuff. So Whirler Virtuoso is really great. I mean, like the bad version of Whirler Virtuoso 
is a 3-4 across two bodies, right? That's like the bad right. version. And one of them's in the air. Because it's not even making the, the servos. It's making thopters. How sick is that, right? I think, I think no. this deck's great. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I just think this deck's great. That's all I have to say about it. Dude, you know what's great to put Ver- Verderous Gearhulk's counters on? A thopter. You can also put it on the Woodland Wanderer, yeah, that, who has that's trample. That's where I would put it. That's I put it there. I love Dude, Voltaic Brawler has trample. This deck is just the trample deck. Deck. And what deck in standard gets to use anywhere close to this many Botanical Sanctum, Inspiring Vantage, Spire Bluff Canal? That's so many of those lands. I mean, this mana base is. I mean, I'd have to test it, but it feels gorgeous to me. He's only got one land coming into play tapped in the first three turns. So here, here, here are my criticisms of this deck so far, which are probably all, are all non non informed criticisms, right? So I haven't tried it yet. We got to have the fourth reflector mage somewhere. It's the dumbest card, right? Three reflector mages, even if it's two plus one, got to have the fourth one somewhere. I, I, I would play the I would play the fourth reflector mage. I have the fourth reflector mage somewhere. I would right? play that. It's got to be better I, I, than I the fourth tireless tracker. I, I think so. I, 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 I would play for Reflector Mage one way or the other. And I think Blossoming Defense is too good. I feel like... I agree. I, I, I'd almost rather just have Blossoming Defense than Tamiyo, but maybe that's hella ignorant. Oh, no, 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 no. You have to play the Tamiyos in this deck. Tamiyo is one of the better parts of this deck. I would play the... Blo- I, I think that there's a good case to be made for a, a couple Blossoming Defense's main deck, one or two. Yep. I, I'm looking at, like, Harness Lightning... Um, maybe, I don't know. I, it's hard to find too much room, but I could imagine trimming one or two Harness Lightnings for two Blossoming Defenses. I just think that Tamiyo is just so disgusting in this deck. So, it's just so powerful because it, it's, it's, it's both offense and defense. It's a durable threat. It's a card advantage engine. It helps for attrition. It solves hard, difficult problems. It, uh, it, 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 it's just, I think Tamiyo is the real deal here. I think the fact that you can, like, so often drop Tamiyo, draw two cards immediately because your spell, like you, your opponent plays a spell on their turn, you spell core it, untap, and then you oh can my just God, draw Tamiyo two. Tamiyo destroy them? Right, exactly. Exactly. Oh, what if you had a Long Test Cub on two or a Servant of oh, yeah. Conduit? All sure. Right, sold. Done. I mean, now I want the fourth Tamiyo on the sideboard. It's yeah, I, a lot of people say that you're supposed to play four Tamios, and that's the whole reason to play deck like a deck like this. Yeah, I think that I I don't mind playing only three because I think you, there's no limit to how many expensive cards you can play, and I prefer the second Verdurous Gearhulk to the fourth Tamio. Uh, I do like Woodland Wanderer, but I think that uh, I I don't have enough experience playing Woodland Wanderer in this deck to know about how, what the mix should be. But on paper, the Woodland Wanderer looks amazing to me right now. Oh, I think it's great in this deck. There's one card missing that. I think that we want to get at least one copy or one plus one copy in. Uh, it's that guy that you were trying to sell me on for forever, but nobody ever played. Uh, green, blue, one, two, four, flash, hexproof. It's, it's perfect in this deck, isn't it? Uh, it looks like it would be playable in this deck, but the problem is that the competition is so steep. Like, we're talking about a deck that only has two reflector mages in the main deck. <laughs> and then no fourth reflector mage. Right, like, Tyler's tracker is not a slouch. Now, Whirler Virtuoso is 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 like slightly more powerful than that two four uh, creature, but it's also much more powerful once you consider the synergies that this deck has to offer. It's so nice to have another place to stick your your energy. The I other mean, thing you is that just... two four has diminished value right now because everybody's playing around rattle chains. Like I just can totally see a situation where. You're like, nothing, nothing, Whirler Virtuoso, go. And your opponent's just like, whatever, Whirler Virtuoso. And they cast, like, pick pick your card, right? They cast, uh, what's the energy tower thing that shoots for three? Um, Dynavolt Tower. Yeah, they go, like, Dynavolt Tower with no energy. Or they go, Painful Truths, draw two or three, right? They do something, just like, whatever, I'm not so not scared of Whirler Virtuoso. And you're like, Tamiyo Field Researcher plus one. They're like dist- obviously with the with the thopter, right? They're right. just destroyed there, right? Like yep. absolutely destroyed. Like they they pick up their cards, they go home, and they don't play magic for a month when you do that. Like it's 
unbelievable. I'm so I love this deck. I would I would experiment with this deck a little bit if I were you. If I were playing tomorrow, I would play White Blue Flash, but I would want to play test this deck if I were playing uh, in an event in a few weeks or you this know, weekend. You know what's cool about this deck? If you could go a completely different direction with the sideboard, if you wanted to, you could just become Pummeler after sideboarding if you wanted, right? Like you could just like switch out these cards uh, and have a combo deck. You could, but I would be surprised if you really want to. That's possible though. Well, the the, the reason that I'm just thinking about it is, Pummeler is it's just it's a completely different line, and people are like, you, you can't play attrition against Pummeler. Like, yeah, but they're already going to want to play as much removal as possible. All right, I agree. I guess, uh, car- but what about Smuggler's Copter? No love? I don't know. The format's kind of hostile towards it right now. All right. Just a thought. You know what you could do? You could sideboard. Get crazy. Sideboard like four Aetherworks Marvel, four Emrakuls, two Ulamogs. I, I uh? experimented pretty heavily with uh, either playing even main deck or testing main deck and then playing sideboard Marvels in Energy Aggro decks. The, the, they're just they're not friends you're actually using no. your energy productively before you get the marvel in play and then like half the time yep. you're flipping the marvel and not hitting an ace so yep. uh and you're, then you're then you're like your brawler died in combat because you didn't save him because you know you, you're saving your energy for the marvel you know something like that and i i didn't find it to be effective but yeah, i didn't I have a cool deck that. julian's deck's awesome I, i'm yep. totally gonna try it uh but you know lots of stuff this week Little little modern ended on one of the coolest decks I've seen in a long time. Very, awesome uh, deck. Very happy about that. Um, so let's uh, let's sign off for this week and uh, and on a super high four color note. Uh, we're top level podcast everywhere. You could just if you pick a place. Twitter, we're there. Patreon, Facebook, YouTube. Uh, if you just show up at Michael Flores' work or his house and just bang on the door, you can be like top level podcast. We are top of a podcast on Stitcher, which which comes oh, yeah. up. That. People asked us that on Twitter a few weeks ago. Yes, we're we're there on Stitcher. So um, speaking of Patreon, just wanted to shout out to Jasper Birch. Jasper, thanks for uh, supporting us on Patreon, and thanks to all our patrons. Thank you, Jasper. If you Much love top love. of a podcast, you can you can love us on Patreon. Extra special, uh, but cool. Um, I'll see you in a few weeks, right, Patrick? Absolutely. Maybe we can uh, record a show uh, in person. I you know, think another show, you know, good. another live face to face. Cool. All right. All right man. Bye-bye. I'll see you next week. Yeah. life didn't work so great. Tried to play dredge, you for jail or hate. Ghostly prison waiting for my untapped phase. Your core trapped in amber space. This Also, a lot of friends got left.